We're ready. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Brain Club. Um, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm the executive director of All Brains Belong. Let me get you oriented into our topic, changing your story. So Brain Club, of course, is our uh, weekly, very intentionally created education space for the collective All Brains Belong community for purpose of providing education about neurodiversity and related topics of inclusion. Um, just to name that this is not for medical or mental health advice. It's also not a support group. All Brains Belong does offer all of those things in additional in, 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 in other programs, but uh, this one is for education purposes only. All forms of participation are okay here at Brain Club. As many of you have figured out, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly do not need you to like sit still or look at the camera or any other neuronormative thing. So feel free to walk, move, fidget, eat, stim, take breaks, um, whatever, whatever needs doing. Um, everyone's welcome, and however you are comfortable um, participating, again, you know, including observation is a completely valid form of participation. Um, no one's going to ask you questions or anything like that, my goodness. Um, so we just want to create space for everyone to uh, participate in their own way. Um, if you are sharing your ideas during Brain Club and how it'll work is that we have a couple of pre-recorded videos from past Brain Clubs that we'll watch first and we'll have the conversation going on in the chat box optionally um, as we as we watch and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion to follow. If you when, if, if you are sharing your ideas, you are welcome to do so with mouth words, typing in the chat box, really whatever whatever works best for you. And the chat, um, especially during the during watching videos, kind of runs in parallel to what's happening on the screen. I may read out selections from time to time, but you know, if 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 it's if it's moving faster than you know is is like meaningful and engaging to you, like feel free to just close it. And the main i the main the main idea is happening here on the screen. Um, here at EBB, we all believe that um, there's no one correct type of brain or body. And that's sort of the premise of um, our programs here. And it's really important to us that we cue safety to all people um, by affirming all aspects of identity um, and making sure that everyone feels included. Um, we do have direct messaging turned on. So if there's ever anything that you need or anything, especially, you know, particularly if you feel excluded in any way, please send a direct message to me so that we can take action on that. It's really important that, that, that really the collective access needs of the group um, really do take priority over other individual types of needs. So we um, try to facilitate Brain Club in a really intentional way to cue safety to all people um, and to create a space where people can collectively learn and unlearn and feel safe right from the very first time, um, experiencing in many cases something that is different from the quote outside world. Um, and as one of our community members um, described Brain Club, uh, to have a place where I'm not masking, I'm not acting, and I'm not spending over half my mental energy asking what they expect of me, I don't have that anywhere else. Um, and so um, thank you for being here today um, and, and for being part of Brain Club. Um, I will also share that that we, as, as always, are continuing to um, look to grow our spread the word team to help spread the word about Brain Club and other other uh, free community programs. Um, and uh, Sarah, do you think you can put in the chat the spread the word sign up form if anybody does want to participate in, in sharing social media posts a couple times a week? That'd be amazing. All right, last bit of access. Um, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon, but if not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You can also do the same and choose side subtitles if you want to turn them off. And that's my visual support to remember to open the chat box. So now I'll see it if anybody's using it. Okay, um, so we are uh, continuing our December theme, Brain Club Greatest Hits, revisiting some of the themes that our staff 
um, thought were the most salient themes that we've reflected on often many times throughout the year um, with the idea that as time goes by that um, these themes um, land differently as we as we uh, gain new experiences and insights. Um, and very excited that we have an extra December Brain Club. Um, this weekend, this Sunday, is our second annual virtual New Year's Eve celebration. And I know many of you have already signed up. That's awesome. Um, so uh, we'd love we'd love for everyone to join us uh, for virtual New Year's Eve. Um, in addition to a New Year's themed brain club, as uh, there'll be Zoom breakout rooms with activities for all ages, including live performances by Rajni Edens, Poppy's Planet, uh, Barry and me, and Todd Gevry. So again, we'd love we'd love for you to join us. Um, so changing your story. What do I mean by this? So I, I'd say one of the things that I am most proud of about our work here at All Brains Belong is, is the opportunity that, that we have this, the privilege, the opportunity to bear witness to something really magical. Um, and that is the idea that when people, particularly people who have been thwarted by the system, um, who have been misunderstood, excluded, invalidated, like all the things. So, so the, people have a narrative that is formed when you have those kinds of experiences. And when people come together here um, and they connect with other people who get it, something happens. And I think it's it's st stories that we hear, like you know, at, at Brain Club, for example, on community panels, we see these themes, right, of people who say that there's something about acquiring language to understand your own experience, um, and you acquire that language by having your experiences reflected back to you through the stories of other people, which is what allows many people to then have a new understanding of themselves, of their life story, um, of, of, of having a different lens for understanding what has been hard and, and why things have been in certain ways. And so that shift of one's self-narrative, um, a shift of, 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 of what someone then begins to believe is possible because of that shift in narrative, like that's I think some of the most powerful work we do here. And I'm gonna share some quotes from some ABB community members, except I did not share screen before I went into full screen mode. Here we go, try again. For me, the first step to rewriting my story was realizing that I didn't need to keep it hidden anymore. My story was safe with people who get it. Another person shared, rewriting my story has been like peeling back the layers of an onion, so much internalized ableism to unpack. Unlearning alongside others has made the process a lot easier for me. Another person shared, I'm grateful for Brain Club. Um, I get to come in the way that works for me and I'm learning to have more grace with myself. And then I think this is the last one. Can you imagine what your story would be like if you learned about your brain at age five instead of decades later? Um, it's essential that we teach all kids about their brains. I could not agree more. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna watch a couple of video clips from past brain clubs. Um, and in particular, we, we chose a couple of clips from past book chats. Um, and so uh, as, as many of you know, throughout 2023, we've done a number of uh, book chats where um, we, um, we reflected on themes of books, even books that, um, that mo most participants had not read. Because um, there's no right way to reflect on a book, turns out. Um, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna first begin with a clip from the book um, "We're Not Broken" by Eric Garcia. 
Amy, take it away. There's an autistic journalist who is the senior Washington correspondent for the Independence. He's a political journalist, um, previously has held additional high profile positions for the Washington Post and other um, uh, elite publications. And um, what this book is about is um, Mr. Garcia discusses examples of systems that were not designed with autistic people in mind. Sound familiar? Healthcare, education, employment. Um, and um, we, in just a minute, will watch a brief um, video interview with Eric Garcia talking about rewriting the narrative of autism. And then after that clip, we'll watch Mr. Garcia discussing um, uh, some examples. Um, in the book, he goes into many more examples than he does in the video clip that, that, that we'll play. Um, but, but he writes quite a bit about what we talk a lot about during Brain Club, um, which is intersectional privilege and intersectional marginalization and um, gives examples and interviews with, with people who are autistic and marginalized because of race, gender, class, employment status, social isolation. Um, and um, with that, I'm gonna stop share. And David, you can take it away. And in fact, you now that I've introduced <laughs> both video clips, David, you can play them back to back and, and uh, okay. cut, down on, cut down on the, the, the steps of cognitive switching for all, for, for you and me. There we go. All right. What I would say to parents who feel that autism needs to be fixed is we do not tell children in wheelchairs that they need to walk. We do not tell deaf children that they need to learn how to hear or they need a culture implant. Uh, we don't tell blind children that they need to see. But for some reason, when it comes to developmental disabilities, we assume that we need to change or alter them in order for them to deserve an education, in order for them to deserve being treated as a human being. Uh, and I think what we need to say is that autistic people are fully formed human beings as is. They are not partially human and that being autistic is part of them. It's not something that afflicts them. It defines how they see and live and interact with the world. Just today on my way to the office, I'm in New York City right now, and I had to think about how do I get to the office? How do I deal with all the stimuli going on with the sound of the car horns and cars whizzing by and people walking past me? Uh, it is an integral part in my day. I think about it constantly with how I move and interact with the world. So in the same way, I am asking able-bodied people and able-minded people to keep autistic people in mind and be understanding and accepting um, because that takes oddly enough a lot less work than trying to change autistic people i think the most important thing to recognize is that Plenty of autistic people of color go undiagnosed or get misdiagnosed. Plenty of black autistic children are misdiagnosed as having a behavioral disorder. And if you're misdiagnosed as having a behavioral disorder, then schools are going to treat you differently. And they're not going to give you the same kind of uh, services that maybe a white presenting child might have. In the same respect, a lot of there's a, a, a lot of the diagnostic criteria is still delivered with white male autistic children in mind. So as a result, a lot of children from English as a second language homes are uh, avoided. On top of that, plenty of girls are, you know, 
overlooked or people who are assigned female at birth, they're often overlooked. And I think that uh, often prevents them from getting the right services that they need. And on top of that, I think because for a long time, we tend to think of autistic traits as something that boys ha uh, have. When it comes to girls, if they're quiet or they're not as socially interactive, we tend to think, about, oh, they're just demure or they're just, you know, a quiet girl. Or if they talk too much, then, oh, you're just a chatty girl. In the same respect, I think when it comes to the LGBTQ plus community, and I say this as a cisgender or heterosexual male, uh, I think a lot of times their needs aren't taken seriously. Or a lot of times they are dismissed simply because they're autistic or their identity is dismissed because how could they know what they want if they're autistic? Uh, but I think once again, their needs to, uh, deserve to be taken seriously or what their desires and what their plans are should be taken seriously and should be taken at face value. Uh, on top of that, I think the other thing you need to remember is that um, misdiagnosis and a lack of diagnosis has a cost. Plenty of girls who get diagnosed later or have difficulties with eating disorders or have trouble with um, interpersonal violence later on. And that's not to blame the girls. It's to say that uh, if you don't understand how you move through the world and how you're disabled, that can lead to people, really bad people taking advantage of. And on top of that, uh, with many people of color who get misdiagnosed uh, or undiagnosed, that can lead to really terrible interactions with law enforcement. Uh, it can lead to incarceration. Read um, some quotes, as we usually do in our book chats. We don't know what autism in and of itself looks like. We only know how autism informed by trauma presents itself. You know, what I'd, what I'd add to that is that, um, you know, the DSM criteria for autism are autistic stress behaviors. Um, that's... And yet, on top of that, it is also true um, that autistic people of color are misdiagnosed um, or inappropriately labeled as, quote, having behavior problems. Everything that Eric Garcia said is true. And there's just so many different layers of what the medical model of autism offers. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, so, you know, we talk about this all the time at Brain Club about how the medical model of autism is so profoundly harmful. Um, and uh, while, while, while Amy's switching to the next video clip, um, I'll, I'll, uh, I was I was, was going to derail down a tangent, but I'll I'll come back to that. Um, so so next video clip um, is an interview with author Sanja Menon um, from Australia, who is an autistic ADHD psychologist and author of the children's book The Rainbow Brain. Um, and as as uh, Sandhya will describe, it's about the the marriage. Uh, she says the marriage of autism and ADHD. Um, and uh, um, not only uh, will we get to hear, uh, revisit our interview with Sandhya for Brain Club, um, but Sandhya will actually read her book in this clip. All right. All right. So I want to tell you about our guest. Can you, um, Amy, you're not yet in shared screen yet. Oh. You were before and popped out of it. Time difference. So Sandhya Menon is an autistic and ADHD psychologist based in Australia. Um, she is the author of two children's books, The Brain Forest and The Rainbow Brain. And tonight we're going to have the, 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 the privilege of um, Sandhya reading us her book. Um, so Sandhya, 
uh, as, as, a, as a psychology consulting practice. And Lizzie, if you can pop the link to her website in the chat, thank you, um, where she provides neuroaffirming accessible information for kids and families. So this book is amazing. Um, uh, as as Sandhya describes it, it's about the marriage of autism and ADHD, which she calls a rainbow brain. Um, and, um, you know, I, as someone who has both an autistic and an ADHD brain, um, sometimes it can be really hard to have a rainbow brain. Um, I have the kind of brain that needs sameness and novelty at the exact same time. It can be really exhausting to have a rainbow brain. And when Sanjay read me her book, I literally cried. It was the most affirming way I had ever seen autism and ADHD and their overlap discussed. Um, I learned something about my own brain um, in listening to it. And um, really, I think, I think, I don't know the rest of my sentence, but um, it's pretty powerful. Um, these were some comments um, from children um, about Sandhya's writings, um, and 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 in our pre-recorded interview, she'll tell the story of how she came to write these books. All right, and um, without further ado, we'll get right into it. So, David, take it away. And by the way, so this this some. Um, this pre-recorded interview and read aloud will run about 30-ish minutes. Um, and so we'll have the chat box going um, as we listen and watch. So I would just, I would love to just hear your story. A lot of stories. Um, so a many bit stories. Of a storyteller, but I can go around and <laughs> Don't we all? Um, yes, I know. So I'll start. Um... I'm going to start at the beginning because that's yeah, wait. <laughs> that is the very way to start the story <laughs> from, the, from the beginning of time. <laughs> um, so I guess I got into psychology because I had a really hard incident happen to me when I was 11. Um, I had a cousin who drowned and died. It was, so, was pronounced brain dead, but then... We kept him on life support and, you know, we've continued going, which is wonderful. Um, but it was a really, really hard point in my life because um, I was 11, he was 18 months, so I was kind of looking after him. You know, it was like that beautiful, like, maternal cousin kind of vibe. <laughs> um, and that's when I had a lot of emotions and decided I wanted to be a child psychologist because I went to the library, I read all about emotions, what is going on with my body. <laughs> um, so that's what started me on this journey of wanting to help other children just understand what emotions are because I've been there, I understand how messy and complex that is. Um, what got me into the field of autism was another cousin of mine um, who was dying not diagnosed, but very autistic, <laughs> um, and recognised ADHD, uh, and we were very close, and so I was like, well, I kind of get it, like, I, I know what this is like, so I started, you know, when I was trying to get more experience, I started in the field of autism, I stayed there because I was happy, I got it, um, and it was just such a great field to be in. And that landed into my eventual autism identification. <laughs> um, ADHD came first for me, I'm very like ADHD forward. Um, and interestingly, once I was medicated, that's when like more autistic traits started coming out. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of overwhelm because I'm like, wow, look, I can focus now. I can definitely do all the things. <laughs> um, and that led to a lot of sensory overwhelm and burnout. Um, and then I landed up at Autism Identification. One of the things that, you know, I'm really passionate about is making sure that we don't have to get there 
right? I was at a point where I was just not even functioning in order to get my identification. Like I was throwing out from sensory like input. I was autistic all along, <laughs> but it was just not recognized. And so, you know, we need to do more in our field to recognize happy autistics. <laughs> um, you know, when we're just like stimming with joy and now I, you know, I advocate really strongly for the next generation. Seeing my son, you know, if I, we, we had this thing, I don't know if you've got it, but where you drop the vitamins into the water, it comes as a little tablet and it fizzes. And to see him go, ah, you know, and just like really happy stems and understanding autistic joy is really nice. Um, so, I, yeah, that's one of the things that I do now. Oh, and managed to summarise my whole journey. Not too badly. <laughs> First of all, I just want to acknowledge, like, like just I, the, the unthinkable trauma that, that you went through and how you tra transformed that to be able to to be making such an impact on the lives of children um that's just ah i sort of acknowledge acknowledge all 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 of that my goodness yeah. oh thank you so in uh, i'm from singapore and like how our family operates is you treat like your cousins as like your siblings right mm -hmm. so who i consider my immediate family like he's part of that um, and, you know, at family dinners, just to see him, like, screaming and crying and not really understanding why because we had no access to his inner world back then. Mm -hmm. So it was years. So I think he only got AAC when he was 16 years old and the accident was when he was 18 months. That was a really, really long time of, I don't know, I'm just going to try to figure it out. It was very messy and muddy. And, you know, that's kind of how I grew up, us just trying to work it out, trying to be curious about what's going on. Um, so we weren't sure. <laughs> so now, you know, I work with a lot of distress behaviours and um, I get it. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. And I, I could not agree more. I mean, DSM criteria for autism are autistic stress behaviors. I'm like, what would this look like to actually, for someone to be able to figure out their true self before reaching like such profound states of dysregulation? Yes, I know. Wouldn't that be lovely? <laughs> um, uh, as, as a psychologist, do you interface with colleagues from the old way like do you like do you or, or have you like steered clear and you just do your own thing I always think you know I am really happy to chat if you're open to learning I'm not open to having an argument I want to you know <laughs> argue with me on that and not take on the information that I'm presenting then that's a waste of my time yes so, yes yeah <laughs> who I am really open to is people who have had a little bit about, you know, what a neuroaffirming approach is, acknowledge that it is challenging and are ready to ask their questions. And then I'm really happy to answer them and like to support them and try to identify, hang on, where's that niggly bit for you and how can I change that? Uh, I'm really happy to do that. And I'm actually doing that in October, which is fun. So this is the story of uh, your becoming a clinician. Um, what's the story of you becoming an author? <laughs> uh, that is a really fun story. That is, you know, ADHD at the helm. Um, I just saw, I literally just had a client come in and ask me a question. And that question really niggled at me. <laughs> she said, some of my classmates don't understand, you know, my client or some of his classmates don't understand him, can you recommend a book for him to get up to the front of the class and talk to everyone about his diagnosis? And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> um, no, I cannot do it that. It doesn't exist. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it exists. Resources like those exist. No, but, but they're, not, they're, they're not the messages that you would want to be out there to the class. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, some, some of them are good, but it's just so my niggly bit is 
I don't think a disabled kid should have to, first of all, share his diagnosis if he doesn't want to, simply because it is bred out of ignorance of his classmates. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, if he wants to share his diagnosis, he can, but it shouldn't be a mandatory thing. It shouldn't be, I have to tell you about my autism in right. order for you to be understanding and inclusive. Mm-hmm. Um, I think inclusion should be at the very heart of our education. So we Amen. can support everybody to understand. I think, you know, on a classroom educational level, we should be talking about these differences and how they exist to make our classroom stronger. Yes. Amen. Um, yeah. So I would love I would love to know um, how when you talk about inclusion, um, what does inclusion mean to you? Yeah, um, really good question. <laughs> um, and I saw I saw a quote recently that really really struck out to me. It's I think belonging is being invited to the party, and inclusion is being asked to dance. And I don't think that's right. Um, so, because you know, if you think about that party scenario, um, you can be asked to dance to it, and they're like, "Wow!" And I think this is what we're doing, right? We're saying, "Well, we're asking you along, we're including you," but we're not paying attention to the fact that, you know, maybe it's still too loud, maybe the party is actually still unwelcoming, maybe I'm in overload. And so we do these basic things that go, well, I've asked you, I've made these things available, but we don't look at the barriers to accessing them. Amen. So I I would argue that inclusion is being part of the planning. Yes. Right? It's having a say in how the party is conducted in the first place. Um, yeah. So getting to look at, okay, well, where are the safe zones, you know? Um, how do I make sure that I have access to the things that help me? How can I make sure that, you know, the music's not too loud? Um, or, you know, go through periods where I feel safer. Those kinds of things, I feel like that is for inclusion. When we invite disabled people to have a say at the table and for it to well and truly be heard, right? Amen. I am a, yeah, I'm a paediatric site. And I hear a lot of, well, we have a safe space in the back or we have fidgets in the room, but, but that's not that's not it. Um, you can't just say, well, we have fidgets. Check. It's and, box checking. Exactly. Um, and But if the child accesses the fidgets, they're made fun of, or, you know, right. because we don't have that fundamental layer of, Everyone is safe enough to use these accommodations okay. to, you know, that attitude change needs to be present first, not just the, the boxes and the things. They, they hadn't changed their view of the world, which is that there's no right way to be a person. And if you, like, normalize that for four-year-olds, like, what a world we would have. <laughs> yeah. You know, one of the things I really love about this book, and I don't know if you know um, Yale Clark, um, she emceed my, the launch of my brain trust. And, you know, she read the book for the first time and she said, this book isn't just for children, Sandy. You know, this book was so healing for me to read. And, you know, what I love about them is, they are just a really simple English way of kind of boiling down what we know in research, what we know in community conversations, to something that's easy to read. It's quick, it's colourful and pretty, which I clearly like. <laughs> um, and, you know, it's just a way of bringing joy. And that's one of the things I really wanted to do with these books is make something cool, you know, and just, not you know I didn't want to just like fiver it and have the book exist <laughs> you know I, I said it had to be looking good so people could actually have a resource that they were really proud of um so I realized that when I read this book it's going to be like mirrored I don't know 
you can change that. But anyway, I'll read it out so you can see the pictures. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad that worked, that works. So this is the Rainbow Brain. It what it does is talk about autism and ADHD together in the same brain. Because, you know, so I wrote the brain for us first when I was just identified as an ADHD. And then by the time it launched, autism came into the picture. Um, but I wrote it as an ADHD. And then when I was identified autistic, I was like, Whoop! you know, I don't know how these rules come together. <laughs> it's really tricky. And I thought, you know what, if, if I have difficulty knowing, you know, which side like is autism dominant, what things I do that are ADHD dominant and how I marry those two together, um, kids would have the same difficulty. So that's what made the rainbow brain. <laughs> it's like, I'll read it. Feel very much like this is story time, everybody. <laughs> I love it. Um, great. Um, so actually, I want to read the dedication. It says, to all the amazing ADHDers who have told me that they have rainbow brains, this, this book was named by you and is for you. Thank you for always guiding me. So what, what a lot of children did after they read The Brain First is they identified with so many things on different pages that they finished it and said, I have a rainbow brain. And I go, well, this is clearly <laughs> the next best, you know, it had to follow. This is your rainbow brain. So while the brain first is just talking about neurodiversity in general, um, the rainbow brain, especially for our neurodivergent people, to see the brain represented. Um, okay, so I'll actually start reading. <laughs> I have a lot of side quests in my brain. Okay. <laughs> So deep down in the brain forest, I found a tree that looks like mine. It wasn't like any brain I'd seen. It had colours that swirled to combine. So we see it's actually here. So it's not just one solid colour. It's got a few colours going on. This tree was a sight to behold with beautiful shades of blue. But all mixed in with that, there was some fiery red too. Fiery red. This swirling, whirling tree is called autism and ADHD. Those are names for what it's like to have a brain like me. Um, and then you see over here, it's, it's ADHD and autism together. Blue and red, peanut butter and jam, butter and bread, mint and lamb. Yes. Will they work together? Amazingly, they just do. Can we know them as one rather than as two? Peanut butter and jam is like my favourite sandwich combination. <laughs> um, it gets purple. We could be wonderful together and come to know this dance of how two seemingly opposing ideas can work perfectly given the chance. Now we're going to some rules. So autism. I like to know what's coming up. I feel great when things are the same. I plan all the smallest details to keep stress out of my brain. And then we have ADHD. I like life to be interesting and new. I feel bored when things are the same. <laughs> details can matter or get tossed aside. Doing, doing what I feel is my aim. How do we marry those two together? <laughs> and, you know, in the rainbow brain, I can deal with change unless a surprise you, you spring. Given choice, control and time, I'm happy to do new things. And this is the ADHD network brain represented. It's lovely. Um, so ADHD, my brain likes to go fast and do lots at the same time. A little of this, a bit of that. How I get things done is mine to define. So talking about affirming executive function skills. Right, we have a different way of getting it. 
and then we have autism like and that's represented kind of more sequentially it's like a cog uh, it says my brain needs to go slow it takes its time to think there are so many facts gathered to collect process and see really talking about that detail orientation do <laughs> i love this little magnifying glass <laughs> Um, so ADHD and autism. I learn best with preferred topics. My interest determines my speed. <laughs> when it's boring, though, I multitask to meet my needs. So we see, you know, a child jumping on a trampoline, um, a spin, a fidget. And it's just kind of nice to have, like, ADHD culture represented in books. Um and so this is the autism page. It says, my brain does not filter. Taking in most sights and sounds. Being in nature is lovely, but I need help in busy surrounds. So we say, you know, turn down the lights. We can use noise cancelling headphones. Or we can, you know, advocate and ask to meet in a quiet space. So, you know, come with me. I can't go there, but you can come here. And ADHD, my brain thinks everything is important. <laughs> I pay attention to it all. <laughs> it's easy to forget what is said. I use strategies to help my recall. One of the instruction at a time, sit closer to the teacher or I make it visual. I draw and write it down. Um, and this is one of my favourites. Um, this is talking about our emotions. <laughs> it's just kind of, you know, all the high highs and news, but the yes and the smileys, but also just the hang on, we need to slow down. We need to just <laughs> um so this is the best way that I can represent our emotions. Um we engage the world with the world so deeply. Our highs are high, our lows are low. However I am feeling, I allow myself. I learned to go with the flow. So really thinking about our compassion for ourselves and accepting where we are. Um, now these colours are swirling to get that are swirling work together, don't you see? Want to know another little secret? There may be more colours in your tree. <laughs> um and then we have this the real rainbow brain. You know, let's talk about ARFID and intellectual disability and anxiety and PDA and Tourette's and OCD and giftedness and, you know, all our learning um, challenges. So dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, dyspraxia, you know, talking about it's not just autism and ADHD. It's very rarely occurring by itself. Um, but let's learn to look at ourselves more holistically. Um, this is, there are so many different trees and a few of them are rainbow. So yeah, we kind of come back to that brain first concept of, you know, this is dyslexia, there's neurotypical brains, there's people who are just autistic or ADHD, and then we've got our rainbow brain. We've kind of added those few more colours in there now. I'm learning more about my brain type. And with the right supports, I grow. So here are some people that help nurture rainbow brains. We're kind of talking about why we see people. Okay, so we have our parents, we have an occupational therapist, we have counsellors, animal therapists, we have our teachers, psychologists, that's me. <laughs> um, you know, we have support workers who might come. Um, speech pathologists and art therapists. So really trying to represent you know, some of the people who we might see. Um, talking about here are some things that can hurt rainbow brains. Loud noises, bright lights, too many things to concentrate on, having to sit still for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> I'm fidgety, I need to move. <laughs> Um, a sudden changes, rejection, feeling misunderstood, and ignoring our body signs. That's being made to, really. 
Um, and yeah, some things that help rainbow brains. So we we have like self advocacy. I need to play by myself today. It's okay, sure. I'll see you later. Right. And you know, just having that connection. So this is something that I used to do at school. I never played with my friends all the time, but they always got that we were still friends. I, I like to do my own thing a lot of the time. All right, so here are some things that help rainbow brains. Resting when we need. Um, my son came up to me the other day and said, well, I'm feeling very tired because it's the first week of school and I need to cancel my <laughs> after school activities. <laughs> I'm like, great. <laughs> I love that you're telling me it is an articulation. Yeah. <laughs> um, sensory accommodations, so using what we need. We have safe and sane foods. And I had to draw chicken nuggets in this. <laughs> like, this is what he actually comes to. I love nuggets. And it like, actually says, I love nuggets. <laughs> I do love nuggets. <laughs> um, asking for what we need, learning about ourselves. Time in nature, time without interests, and meeting others with rainbow brains. This is all my recommendations usually in reports. And I really wanted to give a nod to, you know, we can celebrate rainbow brains, but at the same time talk about how it is a disability and it is really hard. Um, so I depicted it this way. Says having a rainbow brain is special, but the world can be hard to navigate. See, it wasn't built for rainbow brains. There are still changes we need to create. It's tiring moving through this world and we need more time to rest. Making space for self-care and the things we love help us feel at our best. So, chilling out. <laughs> um. Because now we know, oh, so happy. <laughs> um, now we know what works for the rainbow brain design. Go build a wonderful life and shine, shine, shine. And that's it. And then I've just kind of got some other terms and further reading if anyone wants to learn more about it. That's the rainbow brain. I don't even know what to say. Like, I just feel so incredibly honored to have to have you read this to me. Like, it's one thing for me to have, like, read it on my own, but to have you read it to me, like, this is, like, I think I, like, this is, <laughs> anyway, I just, anyway, like, but people, people want to reduce down to, like, well, this is my autism, and this is my ADHD. Anyway, like, this was just such a beautiful, like, even, like, the, the 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 metaphor of color like of course red and blue can become purple of course they can like and, yeah and i appreciate like all of the little details that went in to just even even what you chose to show as images um for these concepts We're just just i am i am blown away this is this is just beyond anything this is incredible. Thank you. That's so nice. I'm so happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, that's very kind of you. You know, I like where my creation, this little room, um, it's just looking at how we represent our culture. And it's so, so nice when that kind of lands with someone else too. All I think about is, you know, first of all, me. Like, what do I love? I love like it. I love fidgets and, you know, <laughs> and then kind of putting that in place. So the end product is something that I'm really, really happy with. And when someone else sees that as well, they're like, oh, I love nuggets too. I was like, you have no idea how much I love nuggets. I love nuggets so much. Yes. I know. Um, and, you know, I was going through a really tough year last year with um, sensory input, particularly around food. And, you know, I would have food cooked for me, so I couldn't even cook, but I would have food cooked for me and it'd be, you know, a balanced meal. And I'd look at it and I just couldn't eat it. And my husband would look at me and now he's learned without judgment to just go, do you need nuggets? <laughs> just so you can eat, you know, and I'm like, thank you so much because I can't handle this right now. I know that, you know, this food 
provides nutrients and nutrition, but right now I need to eat what I can eat. Um, and it's not that plate. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my husband hasn't figured that out yet. Um, but, uh, yeah. yes, that resonates with me a lot. Right. Yeah. yeah. I love um, the nuggets of bringing us together. <laughs> yeah. Um, I had a, so my, my follow-up to nuggets is, uh, is, is French fries. And so mm -hmm. that's, that, that was my dinner tonight. So it was, uh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, can I, so can I tell you a little bit about my favorite tip? I have to. Yeah. 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 So there is this um, chain in Australia that exists. I don't know outside, but it is, they've thought about their chip design so much. And it's actually, it's not square, it is diamond shaped so that the inside is fluffy and the outside is like crisp. It's like, I love it. I said, you have like thought scientifically about how to create the perfect chip, and the seasoning is so good. Oh, that's amazing. Like, well, that's too. so interesting. You're making me think about like the physics of chip design, which I'd never thought about. Like, that's why waffle fries are so much easier to cook. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Right. <laughs> that's your um, this is amazing. Um, amazing the science of our food <laughs> <laughs> i'm curious what um how old is your child before i asked him? i was gonna ask you like what, what what does your child think of your book um, six are um, our children the same age yeah um so he actually helped me create the brain for us when he was four which is amazing because you, you, you know what amy uh, let's 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 pause i think um i somehow you know brain and time and all that um i uh i what i'll do is i will link in the chat the link to the original the original brain club if anybody wants to watch the rest of it um but i just i'm noticing that it's 656 <laughs> so much for we'll have plenty of time for discussion it's kind of how that goes so anyway um i would love to invite anyone to share anything that's coming up for them Mel. Hi, Matt. I just, um, I wanted to say um, thank you to you and um, to All Brains Belong and the community. And I, I just wanted to say how grateful I am um, uh, for my involvement and um and how that involvement has helped me edit my own story. That's all. That's so beautiful, thank you. I mean, it's a journey, right? I mean, it's just a, it's a long, never ending journey, but I don't know, I think, I think for a lot of people that it, 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 it kind of the I'm um, I'm not finding words, but like the the stepwise or the like it's like the fast track, even though it's not a fast track at all, it's a faster track of editing when you are doing it with others. And that's not to say that it's not a really hard and possibly difficult journey. But the idea of, of I, I think I think without connection with other people, without connection to community, without without this, I don't I don't I, I think for a lot of people that own learning doesn't even happen. Yes. Exactly. It's like all these small and big reframes in the chat right now. There's folks reframing their self-talk around 
challenges with food. Like it's, it's th these everyday interactions, these everyday judgments um, that all come from narratives that were like fed to us, literally, like, you know, as young children of like, this is the way, this is the way you do the thing. Whereas, no, there's lots of ways to do the thing. And so our New Year's Eve Brain Club um, is really a part two of this conversation. Um, 2024, year of the true self. And what does that mean? Um, we'll have some, um, uh, we'll, we'll do an intentional job of having the pre-recorded community panel be short um, so that we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Um, thanks, Sarah, for, for dropping the link in there. Um, and that's just even part of New Year's Eve. There's a whole bunch of activities. So we we hope we hope to see many of you there. Oh, Sarah, thanks for the reminder. Um, there will be no brain club next Tuesday. So we'll have this extra brain club on Sunday, but no brain club on Tuesday, January 2nd. Um, but we'll be back on January 9th. And our January theme is the power of community. So thank you very much to all of you for being part of our community. Have a good night. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Thanks Mel. Everyone.